Okay. Um, what do we mean by population-based study? Sometimes also called area-based or geographically-based studies. Well, basically these are studies that involve a directly defined population, which is uh, often called primary population, because uh, it is identified a priori before starting the recruitment of study participants. Uh, a very famous example is the uh, Framingham Heart Study. It was started uh, in the 50s and uh, it involved uh, sampling a cohort of about 5,000 men aged 30, 59 years from the city of Framingham in Massachusetts. And this court was, was then followed up, and I think it's uh, still under follow-up. Uh, Population-based cancer registries are, all, are also good examples. These are disease registries which uh, aim at uh, recording all cases of cancer, in this case, arising in a given geographical area or population. Uh, and many, many data, many routine sources collect population-based data. For instance, uh, birth certificates in Italy, for instance, or uh, hospital discharge records in which all the um, eligible uh, uh, subjects are recruited. In contrast, uh, hospital-based study um, are characterized by the fact that participants are recruited in one or more hospitals, regardless of the population these cases arise from. This means that, if anything, an effort can be made afterwards to try to define the population that, uh, uh, from which these cases originated. This is, uh, the population is defined starting from the cases, on the characteristics of the, on, of the cases. That's why it is called secondary population or indirectly defined study population. And we will see later that some, sometimes this exercise is almost uh, a mission impossible. So it's not uh, easy to identify the underlying populations. Uh, examples are hospital-based cancer registries. For instance, in Italy, there is a network of pediatric hemato-oncological centers that uh, um, uh, record all the cases of cancers treated within the network. So cancers that go somewhere else, even abroad, for instance, they don't appear in this register. <coughs> Networks of neonatal intensive care unit, uh, some are very, uh, very well known, the Vermont Oxford in the United States and other places, the Euroneonet um, network of neonatal intensive care. These are valuable, um, they provide valuable information on the outcome of neonatal of newborns treated within the network, but uh, the information is partial, as we will see. And uh, uh, of course, often clinicians are involved in hospital-based study for prognostic uh, um, estimation, because they are interested in knowing what is the outcome of the patients they have treated. Uh, but they should know that the patients they have treated are just a subsection of the patients with that given disease. And we will see what this can imply. Uh, for this presentation, I will use uh, the following terms. Cases are people with the outcome of interest, whatever it can be generally a disease, uh, but 
not necessarily. We can uh, study other outcomes. By study sample, I mean the study participants, individuals actually recruited in the study. Target populations is the overall population we would like to be able to generalize our findings to. Uh, and the source population, uh, or stud or also called the study base or study population, is the actual population from which the study cases arise. Target population and source population sometimes uh, coincide, they are, they, are, they are the same, but often they don't because our aim is scientific generalization to a wider population of, let's say, patients with a given disease. Uh, because uh, a, in hospital-based study, the population is defined as secondarily to recruitment of cases. And we often do not know where do these cases arise from. It may be very difficult to know to which subjects the results of our hospital-based study can be extrapolated or generalized. For instance, this graph shows you the results of uh, um, survival to hospital discharge of very preterm babies, gestational age 20 to 31 weeks, recruited in uh, um, an area in Italy. The area is represented, is, uh, includes three regions, Lazio, Marche, and Emilia-Romagna. And uh, the study was population-based. All births occurring within one year of study in those geographical areas were included, both stillbirths and live births. And uh, for his, for, well, we can see at a glance uh, that survival improves uh, with increasing gestational age. And the improvement is quite uh, steep, uh, up to 26 weeks gestation, where really every week matters, while it becomes, it flattens afterwards. But what I want to show you that uh, depending on how you define your uh, um, population and denominators, you can get uh, different results. Um, for instance, if uh, you are interested in survival of all birds, let's say all infants, all newborns or fetuses, alive at onset of labor. Then in your denominator, you can have also the stillbirths, those who died uh, during labor. And uh, the overall survival is indicated by the first uh, um, blue dot with 95% confidence intervals. Okay. And you can see that, for instance, no baby survived at 22 weeks. But at 23 weeks gestation, this is the survival rate of all births, including live and still births. This is the survival rate if we consider it only live births, only live births. And the third um, estimate indicates survival of uh, babies admitted to NICUS only. So the third estimate can be considered the result of a hospital-based study. And we can see that there are differences, big differences between this and this, but also between these two estimates, particularly at the lower gestational ages. In general, hospital-based studies tend to overestimate 
survival. And this is uh, the pattern in Italy where all, all newborns, all, all live births are generally resuscitated and transferred, admitted to neonatal intensive care. In other countries, the differences between these two rates can be much, much wider. Another example. Uh, these are the results of an area-based study carried out in Western Australia on the outcomes of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. This was a population-based study and uh, they had 71 live-born patients with congenital diaphragmatic hernia, a serious neonatal congenital malformation that requires uh, immediate surgical treatment. But out of 71 live-born babies, only 46 survived to reach a surgical center. The others died before arriving to it. And uh, 40 survived to sur surgery, 37 survived uh, over one year. So the true overall survival at one year was 52%, about half of live births. However, if we are working in a surgical center and we want to perform a prognostic study follow-up of the babies with these conditions treated in our center, or also in a network of surgery centers, the rates will be very different. 37 out of 46 gives a survival of 80%. So we can say good prognosis for these babies, but it is not the true value. Okay, so what is the problem? The problem is the possibility of selection errors, uh, more likely in hospital-based studies. Selection error or selection bias is a systematic distortion of study results deriving from the way participants are selected for the study. And uh, um, in contrast with random error, it cannot be corrected by increasing the sample size. There is a very, very famous example of selection bias, which does not concern uh, uh, medicine, though. In 1936, there were the US presiden presidential election Alfred Landon against Franklin Roosevelt. And a very respective magazine, Digest, Literary Digest, started one of the largest and more expensive polls ever carried out on these issues. They um, scanned telephone directories in the United States, uh, club memberships list, magazine subscribers, rosters of association members, and uh, uh, put together a mailing list of about 10 million names. They launched their poll announcing, once again, we are asking more than 10 million voters, one out of four, to settle November elections in October. And the results of the poll were that London would win with 57 of votes against 43% for Roosevelt. Of course, everybody, everybody knows that this was not the, what happened. What happened was that Roosevelt won 62% of voters against 38%. So what happened? A combination of selection bias and non-response bias. The list compiled by Digest included mostly middle upper class. Uh, at the time, to have a telephone 
in your home was not that uh, um, common in the United States and it uh, virtually excluded uh, the low class. And uh, uh, these middle upper class people were more likely to be Republican rather than Democrats. And uh, additionally, out of the original 10 million names, only 2.4 million responded to the survey, non-response bias. Ironically, at the same time, Gallup was able to predict the correct result with only 50,000 people, showing that uh, um, selection bias cannot be uh, corrected by increasing the sample size. Other examples of selection bias, uh, mem membership bias, that was also what was seen in this poll, but in medicine, yes. I'm sorry, sorry to listen. Is it okay that I ask a question about the uh, uh, previous slide? Yes, good. Um, yeah, the, uh, it's quite clear that those who were um, those who were had a telephone, they wanted to vote the Republican. But can you um, discuss a little more about the uh, uh, response uh, rate being only 2.4 million against 10 million? I, I think 2.4 million is quite a lot. So isn't isn't it so that you have to have a relationship between participating? Uh, willingness and, and uh, a decision of, of the vote in, in order to make that this is dangerous? Well, it is a well-known problem also in epidemiology. People who refuse to participate in a study or do not respond to a male questionnaire, for instance, or uh, get lost to follow up in a prospective follow up study tend to be different from those who answer and stay in. If the um, loss to follow up, for instance, would be random, non differential, not linked to the exposed, there could be no problem apart from reducing your sample rate. The point is that very often, most of the time, it is differential. It is related either to the exposure or to the outcome that you are studying. And this introduces bias. In this case, most likely, apart that a lot of people just don't care, they don't answer. But it is possible that those who were, it was, there was a, an economical crisis at the time in the United States. And so maybe people who were uh, poorer, less educated, but more likely to vote Democrats were prevailing among non-responses. And then, of course, there was the effect of the uh, type of study design, a, you know, a, mail questionnaire or a poll launched by a magazine, it's very difficult to have uh, a good response rate. We know that these kind of surveys have low response rates. In general, it's a problem. But the point is that uh, non-response can, can bias the results of the study. It's not only that your study becomes smaller and less powerful. It's that the sample, the remaining sample, may be most likely biased. What it is done very often is that if you have baseline data, uh, for instance, in, the follow -up, in a follow-up study, you recruit participants at the beginning of the study and you collect some basic data about exposure, about uh, uh, socio-demographic characteristics and everything. Then you can try to see whether the characteristics of those who returned for follow-up are very different from the characteristics, baseline characteristics of those who were lost. But uh, uh, 
sometimes, in, like in this situation, you don't have. And anyway, it is, uh, uh, it is debatable what you can do. Uh, loss to follow-up can be a problem even in randomized control studies, and a big problem. Because randomization, as Patrick said, is a very powerful issue to obtain comparable, uh, ex comparable groups at the start of the study. But then, at the end of the follow-up, a lot can have, be, can, can have happened. And if there is differential loss to follow up, maybe because those who um, had good results, a good outcome, are more likely to show up at follow up, while those who had a bad outcome disappear, go somewhere else, or the other way around, whatever. Losses to follow up are big problems. <laughs> Okay, so other examples to selection, selection bias. The healthy worker effect or the healthy migrant effects. For instance, in perinatal epidemiology, results looking at the uh, perinatal outcome of migrants compared to resident population uh, yield conflicting results. Sometimes they have a worse outcome, sometimes they have a better outcome. And uh, this is because uh, um, they, migrants may be in a worse socioeconomic conditions and uh, uh, this can lead to a worse perinatal outcome. But on the other hand, they may be younger and uh, they may be healthier than the general resident population. Because you go to another country to work and uh, to find a job and uh, this is it. Uh, there are some bias that gained uh, eponyms. The Neiman bias is the prevalent incidence bias. The fact that prevalent cases are cases that have been around longer and so they are more likely to be picked up for the study. While uh, mm, sometimes uh, if uh, a disease has a fatality rate, uh, those who die earlier, they just disappear. This is why in case control study, the best option is to um, recruit only incident cases, newly diagnosed cases, if you can, because they are less likely to be selected and also the recall of exposure can be easier. Prevalent cases, those that have survived, are different and that they are uh, risk factors distribution can be different. Another bias that is frequent and a problem in hospital-based studies is the uh, so-called Bergson paradox or admission rate bias. Uh, sometimes uh, mm, the knowledge of the exposure uh, may lead to increased hospitalization of uh, some cases. This was the case, for instance, in a study exploring uh, uh, intrauterine device as contraceptive measure and risk of uh, salpingitis. Salpingitis, salpingitis, I'm not sure. And uh, the fact is that uh, women with uh, possible symptoms for salpingitis were more likely to be sent to the hospital by day by their general practitioner, if it was known that they were using an intrauterine device, because it was felt that this was a risk factor for the disease. This meant that in a hospital-based study, the cases of salpingitis recruited were more likely than the general population to have an IUD. And so this falsely 
uh, led to, um, to an association. Questions? So, hospital-based studies are more prone to selection bias. First of all, because hospitals that participate in studies themselves they may be selected. They may be excellent, excellent centers, tertiary level hospitals, university affiliation, or they simply can be self-selected. They have to agree to enter a network, for instance. And this selection criteria may affect also the characteristics of the patients that are treated in these hospitals. And then the patients admitted to hospitals may be a selected population. For instance, they may have more severe stage, disease stage, than uh, cases in the general population, or they may also have different demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. An example of, uh, let's say, different characteristics of admitted patients were uh, found in this study. They found that mainly the younger hypothyroid patients are referred to hospitals. And this is a type of uh, selection bias which is called referral bias. This was basically a, a well-defined population cohort, but they compared the non-referred uh, hypothyroid patients, those treated at home by their GP, with the referred to the hospital. The referred were basically younger, 50 years versus 66, and they had uh, a more severe uh, condition. Does this matter? Well, it can matter if risk factors differ between patients who are admitted and those who are not. Then studies aimed at assessing causal relations may be biased. And therefore, selection bias can be a thread not only for generalizability of our study results, but also for internal validity, correct assessment of a causal relationship or of a relationship between risk factors and outcome. And the issue is particularly relevant to hospital case control studies. You know that uh, Control studies are studies in which the study sample is selected on the basis of the outcome of interest. For instance, um, I, if I want to study the relationship between smoking and lung cancer, my cases would be cases of lung cancer and uh, the control group will be patients without lung cancer. And I want to ascertain the exposure in both groups, Smo history of smoking. That's the way, it's a very efficient way because rather than uh, recruiting a cohort of smokers and non-smokers and waiting 20 years to see whether they develop lung cancer or not. Uh, you can just take the cases of lung cancer and the sample of non-cases and very quickly get an answer. The problem is that uh, um, the case, case control studies are more difficult to design. And the very difficult thing is the choice of controls. 
Ideally, you should think of a case control stada, study as uh, a study nested within a cohort or within a population. You aim at recruiting all the eligible cases that arise from a given population and ascertain their exposure. Then, rather than studying the entire cohort or population, you take a sample of it, a sample of known cases of persons at, at risk of becoming cases, but they are not yet cases. And uh, very important, the selection of the known cases, called controls, should be independent from the exposure. You can see that here it really represents the exposure distribution of the population. Controls have the function of providing an estimate of the exposure distribution in the source population, in the population that give rise to the cases and they should be representative of the same source population from which the cases arise. Uh, epidemiologists often use the Wood criterion. If a control had had the disease I am studying, would he or she uh, end up in my series of cases? If the answer is yes, this is good because it means that controls are really at risk of becoming cases and are from the same source population. If not, there may be problems. Um, it's I don't know well, it's to be representative in general means that uh, they should be a random sample of the study base, ideally. I'll show you an example. Uh, the, 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 my question is on uh, the term representative. By representative, I mean uh, they, have the have, they must have the same exposure distribution as the source population. And uh, to, to have this, uh, ideally, they should be a random sample of the source population, of the study base. Mm -hmm. okay. um, this is an example of population-based case control study that was carried out in Italy. It was aimed at exploring the relationship, the risk factors for childhood leukemia and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma diseases for which very little is known in terms of etiology. And uh, um, most regions in Italy participated really. It was a very large, very large study and it was a population-based case control. Why? Well, cases were all newly diagnosed cases, incident cases, of leukemia and non-Hodgkin lymphoma occurred during the study period in children age 0 to 10 years in the participating regions. These cases were ascertained completely because these cases always reach a hospital. So they were diagnosed in the hospitals and reported to the study coordination center. To choose controls, two controls for each case were randomly selected, matching for sex, date of birth, and area of residence, using the lists of the national health services. In Italy, all children have a pediatric GP, a general practitioner, and there are lists of the children with the names of their doctors. So it was complete, 
or fairly complete list of children of that age living in that region. Controls were sampled for this population. Randomly, it was a randomly, random stratified sample. So this is what I mean. We can assume that they were within strata representative of the exposures prevailing in the study population, in the study base. Uh, but the problem is that in population-based studies like this one, the source population was defined a priori. It was represented by all the children, 0, 10, age, uh, 10 years of age, living in the regions participated, participating in the study. It was very clearly defined, and we had the list of them name by name. Uh, if you are, in contrast, carrying out a, a hospital-based case control study, and uh, you are not sure which is the source population which is feeding your cases that you find in the hospital, how do you select your controls? That's the big question in hospital-based case control studies. Okay, hospital controls are often selected and they may be a good choice because they may be likely to arise from the same underlying source population that gave rise to the hospital cases. Because these are people that go to that specific hospital if they are sick. So probably they are from the same population. And in fact, hospital controls are often selected for hospital-based case control studies. However, they are still patients, they are sick. By definition, they are different from the population which is not in hospital. And in particular, they may be more similar to the cases than uh, population controls would be. For instance, there are many um, diseases that have similar exposure. In adult population, smoking and alcohol are risk factors for many diseases. And so they, these controls may be affected by diseases that share the same exposure as the disease under study. So you, in that situation, you may not be able to identify the exposure that caused the disease. Uh, I'm finishing the sentence, eh? because the, the same exposure is also in controls. I mean, if you are um, making, if you are studying the relationship between smoking and heart disease, you don't want to have your controls with lung cancer. Okay, Patrick. If your controls are a bit too similar to your cases, that's a problem. Is it only a problem when the result is non-significant? That is, if, if you have those types of control, which you fear are too much resembling at your cases, but you nevertheless you find an association between the exposure you're studying and the disease. Is this association false? It may be biased in the sense that it may be uh, less strong than it would be with a different... Uh, you may find no association when this is, or you can find a weaker association or whatever. Um, So when you select hospital controls, 
there are some options that are often followed. First, you select controls in emergency rooms, orthopedic departments, immunization services, because these people, I mean, if a child is admitted for a broken leg, okay, he is probably more similar to the people that you find around in the general population, because it doesn't really have a, a disease. But of course, if you are studying adults and you want to study a disease, the association between alcohol use and a given disease, heart, coronary heart disease, you don't want to take your controls from the orthopedic departments, because you may find more people who had an accident because they were using alcohol. So, another possibility is to select controls with several types of diagnosis. You mix, you have a mixed um, control group, because in, that, uh, in the hope to dilute the biasing effect of the possible inclusion of a disease related to the exposure of interest. But there are other options. For instance, the use of family members, siblings, cousins, friends, schoolmates, neighbors. Um, this is often, you, often done. It may have the advantage that uh, in this way you match for uh, socioeconomic background. And in the case of siblings, you may match also for genetic influences. On the other hand, again, this type of controls, they may be too similar to the cases, then it would be um, uh, advisable. And uh, um, again, you may not find differences or find the bias difference. Additionally, if you match, for instance, siblings and cousins, you have to take matching into account when you analyze your data. You have to use matched analysis techniques. But finally, and we are almost finished, even if you have a hospital-based case control studies and your cases are from the hospitals, you may still try to obtain population controls. If you can identify a more or less well-defined hospital catchment area, you can find to pick up your controls from that area. If rosters exist, for instance, at, as list of children, you can use them or you can use random digit dialing to pick up population-based controls. Sometimes more than one control group is used, hoping that one, of the, one control group adjusts for a given bias, possible bias, and another one adjusts for a different possible bias. This is uh, rarely done because it is expensive, of course. Uh, results can be difficult to interpret if they go into opposite direction. But if they go in the same directions, it is reassuring. For instance, there was a case control study on the relationship between uh, medicines and Rice syndrome. And they use three different groups of controls hospital, population-based, and then another group. And all of them found the rel a relationship with aspirin use, and it was in the same direction. Not identical, but that was fairly uh, a strong, strong evidence of the relation. So to to summarize, both population and hospital-based studies have advantages and drawbacks. Population-based studies are conceptually easier and easier to design intuitively, but they are often more expensive and more difficult to organize and to carry out. 
Hospital-based study can be very convenient, but particularly if they are case control hospital study, you have to be very careful in your selection of controls. And sometimes there are also trade-offs to be negotiated between validity and feasibility of the study. Thank you. This is the end.